Well, that's an interesting reading, isn't it? Um, I don't know if you thought uh, that maybe Paul had accidentally read from a Milton Boone novel, or from the script of Bridgerton, or something like that, but it's a slightly surprising reading. Um, but I can assure you um, that that was uh, from the Bible, from the Book of Song of Songs. And um, the Book of Song of Songs is a really interesting book, right in the middle of the Bible, written by Solomon. It seems to have sort of two primary sort of roles, if you like, within the canon of Scripture. Firstly, it's a celebration of human sexual love. Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, it's sort of like a bit embarrassing, even a bit, Paul read was slightly embarrassing, but as you kind of go on, it becomes even more sort of like, oh, gosh, it's almost a bit racy. Um, as you go through the book, I thought it was fair, Paul, uh, the, the, the sort of embarrassment of having to read some of the other parts of it, but, um, but it's, it's a celebration of, of human sexual love. And uh, it's also thought to be, and maybe more interestingly, a metaphor. A metaphor for our relationship with God. It starts, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. It's a metaphor, not just a celebration of human love, but a metaphor for the relationship that we have or can have with God. And, and as I say, at times it's embarrassingly intimate. What's it got to do with worship? We're doing a series at the moment on the subject of worship. And as we talk about it today, I'm not sure that I'm going to say anything particularly new to you, but I guess what I want to try to do, and what I'm hoping we do as we journey through this little series together, is I just want to encourage us really in our own uh, expression of personal worship, but also our corporate worship here as a church. Just encourage us in, in, in that activity, the activity of worship. What does Song of Songs have to do with our corporate worship together? Well, um, let me take a step back and then we'll come back to that question. You know, worship means to ascribe worth to something or to someone. It means to ascribe value to someone or to something. I, uh, I've been in Salisbury all week. Uh, and uh, on a diocese course, and on Wednesday, basically, there wasn't, we were staying in a sort of theological college, there wasn't really anything to do in the evening, so we ended up at the pub each evening, and on Wednesday night, I had the great pleasure of bumping into, there was just me and another guy, we were walking back, the great pleasure of bumping into a very large group of West Ham fans. <laughs> um, yes, I can see some animated uh, movement within, they were very drunk, I don't think it was David and Kathy, you only saw them this week, were you know that they were very drunk and they were very, very excited about something. Uh, I was going to show you a little clip of a child that you may have seen on the BBC website on Beaver the News. Do you remember that the, the clip? He was just like so psyched up on Wednesday night as they sort of like, um, I'm not going to try and even mention the, uh, the styles because it might just, we might have a complete meltdown if we try anything else. But I had this little clip of him. And uh, you, you saw it, he was so excited that West Ham had won the Europa League. I imagine maybe that's how Man City fans felt last night, but uh, to be honest, they're just a little bit more used to it than West Ham fans. Um, so, um, but it, it was like he was so excited. And it was obvious from, from looking at him that he ascribed a great deal of value, a great deal of worth to, um, to West Ham. And you know, the truth is this, that, that all of us worship something. All of us worship something. The question isn't so much about whether we worship something, it's about what do we worship. And of course, as Christians, um, we, we believe that our, the, the, the primary focus, the primary object of our worship should be God himself. You know, Jesus, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength, oh, well, well done, sir, and mind. And so Jesus was saying, actually, the, 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 our priority is the worship of God, to love God with everything that we have. And of course, that doesn't mean that we can't ascribe value to other things or other people. Actually, the, the good news, I think, of 
what Jesus was saying when he said that is that actually as we as we ascribe greatest value to God, we actually learn how to value and ascribe worth to others as well, to other people and, and to other things. Everything else begins to fall into its proper place. The second commandment, Jesus said, is like the first, actually, to love your neighbour as yourself. It's as we love God that we learn truly how to love our neighbour. And we demonstrate that um, we demonstrate that the valuing of God in, in, in a range of different ways, a range of different ways that could be considered worship. One of the primary ways in which we demonstrate our own valuing of God is through obedience to him. That actually, as we read his word, we, we actually trust that he's a good God and that we, we willingly place ourselves under his laws and his precepts and his wisdom and his principles. And so through obedience to God, we demonstrate that we value him. And we value, we demonstrate that value of God through our kindness to other people. So Jesus said, love your neighbour as yourself. But actually, as we love others, we demonstrate our valuing of God. As we do the shopping for our neighbour, or, or whatever it is that we do, we demonstrate our valuing of God. Our work can demonstrate that we value God. It's interesting in the Old Testament Hebrew language, the word for worship and the word for work were the same word. It was the same thing. And actually we can work. And whatever we do, whether it's we work in finance or as we work in the NHS or we work in whatever field it is, we can do all of it for the glory of God. And actually through our work we demonstrate our value of God. All of those things can be seen as worship in one way or another. But there's something that's unique, isn't there, about when we come together. There's something that's unique about the worship that we experience here in church or when we gather together with other Christians. There's two things that usually characterise that worship. The first thing is that it, it gives opportunity for us to give voice to the praise and the adoration and the worship of God. Whether it's through liturgy or through songs, as we participate in that, we give voice, we speak words of praise and adoration. But there's another aspect to it as well, and that is that actually our worship when we gather together should create space for an intimate encounter with it isn't just about us speaking our words to God, but actually it creates a space for an encounter with Him. It creates space for intimacy, for a meeting with God. There was this document written in the 16th century called the Westminster Catechism. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. It was written by the church in England and the church in Scotland. It was a bit like a creed, but it was basically a statement that was saying these are the things which new converts need to know and to understand. It was like a summary statement of what, of what Christians believed and what the church began to teach to people that converted to Christianity. And the very first, it was written as a series of questions and then a series of answers. And the very first question is this, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of humanity? And the answer that the Westminster Catechism gave is this. Humanity's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Humanity's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That statement brings together those two aspects of worship, doesn't it? Firstly, the glorification of God, that we speak out our praise and our adoration. We fix our hearts and our minds upon who God is and upon what God has done. And we speak it out, sing it out. We glorify Him. But the second part, and there's enjoyment in that, but the second part is that we enjoy 
We enjoy him. Do you enjoy God? It's what you were created for. You were created to enjoy God. Enjoy a relationship with him. It's kind of intimate language. And I guess as we think about that, we begin to think actually maybe the metaphor, the song of songs, maybe that actually begins to make a little bit more sense. That's our relationship with God is supposed to be about awe and glory and wonder. But it's also about intimacy. It's also about enjoying. Maybe in the same way that the, the man and the woman in the Song of Songs enjoy one another, enjoy one another's love. And so our worship together should include those things, it should include that sense of awe and glory, and it should include that sense of intimacy and meeting with him. The New Testament word for worship that's most frequently used is a Greek word, it's called, it's the word proskunio, I've said this before, uh, but it's a really interesting word, it's hard to sum it up with one English word, because it really is a concept, it, it's, the, it's the idea of drawing towards somebody who is in authority, bowing before them and kissing it's like as we bow before that person, they hold out their hand to us and we have the opportunity to kiss their hand. It's a picture of both awe and reverence, submission, but it's also a picture of intimacy, closeness. Prostuna, the word that the New Testament uses most frequently for worship, awe and intimacy. It's the singing of the song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and at the same time, in the same little group of songs, singing, Jesus, I love you. Or, glory, intimacy. Let me just take a moment to um, turn to a different passage of scripture, and just look at an example of this, and turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, well known passage. I think it's going to come on the screen, yeah, wait for that. <clears throat> this is what it says It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim. Each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And it says, at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. It's an amazing scene. It's, it's actually set in the year that the king had died. Uh, I say that because I think next week, I think it's next week, Claire is going to talk about worshipping when it hurts. Which is a profoundly powerful thing to do. But for Isaiah in this moment, and for the nation, they've lost up King Isaiah. King Isaiah, you know, when you think about generally the kings, he was a pretty, he was okay. He was a reasonably good king. And he died, and it was this time of sort of national unsettlement. And in that year, Isaiah has this vision. We don't know where he was exactly when he had the vision, but he has this vision of God in the temple and the worship of God taking place in heaven. And it's, and it's a scene that is filled with a sense of awe and wonder. There's these... Um, he sees the Lord, he sees the, the throne, the train of his robe filling the temple. He sees these angelic creatures with six wings, and he hears their song as they call to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Actually, as we worship, we join in with the eternal worship that takes place in the throne room of heaven. It's an awesome thing. And then it says this, that the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, 
and the temples filled with smoke. Such is the awe of the scene. Imagine if we were worshiping in this, the whole building begins to shake. It's not an earthquake, but just the entire building starts to shake. The whole building is filled with smoke, not like fire smoke, but just, I don't know, some sort of sense of the Lord's physical manifestation of the glory of God in our midst. That's what Isaiah sees in his vision. It's incredible. A sense of awe and wonder. As he sees into God's throne room, sees the, the worship that takes place in the throne room of heaven day and night and day and night for all of eternity. Just standing in awe of the creator of the universe. What a scene. I've just been in Salisbury Cathedral. I said in Salisbury this week, we were worshipping in Salisbury Cathedral each evening. We went, I went to Evensong. Now, if you were to line up all of the forms of Christian worship and say, which, which do you find you get the most from? Evensong would be quite near the bottom of that list, if I'm completely honest with you. But I also am fully aware that worship is not for me. You go home and you go, I didn't get much out of worship today. Well, that's okay, it wasn't for you. It wasn't for you. The worship in the Salisbury Cathedral, it wasn't for me. It was for God. So I went along each evening and tried to, <coughs> my best to engage. And to, but as we were there, was, there was one thing which was undeniable, there was a sense of awe about the, the place, of, you know, like a, like a temple, church, this incredible building, built to the glory of God. This, the sound of the, the psalms and the scriptures being sung, a sense of awe about it. And when I spoke to my colleagues who maybe found that style of worship a little bit easier to engage with, I was just mindful that actually for them there was intimacy in that as well. And I pursued that as I sat through this thing, which for me was a bit uncomfortable, but I sat there and pursued that for God to meet with me in this place. There should be a sense of awe in our worship. But then this interesting thing happens as the story goes on. It says this, it says, um, Woe to me, Isaiah cries. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. I think one of the things that happens in worship is we always have a clearer sense of who God is. And we also, I think, have a clearer sense of who we are. And that's what happens to Isaiah. Initially, he's saying, woe, woe to me. He becomes aware of his sinfulness, his brokenness, and you know he, he thinks he's going to die. Such is the awesome presence of God. But then this amazing thing happens, and as he's continuing to see in this vision, he sees this angelic creature coming to the the, the altar and taking a, a coal from it with a pair of tongs and then coming to him and touching his lips and saying these incredible words. See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned. In this place of awe, there was this moment of profound intimacy where God, through this angelic being, literally touches the lips of Isaiah with his cup. And as he does that, he says to him, your sin is atoned for, your guilt is taken away. It's intimacy. God reaches out and touches Isaiah in this vision. 
And I, and I think actually God, by his spirit, as we worship him, part of the grace of worship is that as we worship God, God, through his spirit, wants to reach out to each one of us. This beautiful verse at the top of that PowerPoint from James, chapter 4, I think it's verse 7. It says, come close to God and he will come close to you. That's the grace of worship. But actually as we draw near to God, as we set our hearts on drawing near to him, as we glorify him through words, through song, the promise is that I will come close to you. I will come close to you. And kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than life. All the kisses. And I guess, friends, I just I appreciate that probably none of that is particularly new to you. But I want to encourage you, I want to encourage us as we worship to, to anticipate and to pursue both things. And I guess, just to, start, just, to, just to finish actually, you know, as, as you leave here and you go into the rest of your week, whatever your week holds for you, I want to just remind you that one of, the, one of the most profound, best ways of knowing the presence of God in your week, Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, is through the practice of worship. Whether you're driving in your car, sitting in your office, Walking your dog, cutting some of his hair, feeding your kids, taking a moment before everybody else gets up with a cup of coffee, whatever it is that you do this week. One of the most profound and best ways to experience the presence of God is simply through the practice of worship. Because as we come near to Him, He comes near to us. All and intimacy.